Oh. Ah. <laughs> oh no. So, um, hello, Felipe. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Too. I don't think I've seen you in person for uh, about forty-eight years. <laughs> no, for a bad. while, yeah, it's been. It's if it definitely feels like that, right? Oh my God! Uh, so here we are. What is it? November thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth. It's a great day to do anything. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to be in the basement and hope it doesn't flood. Oh you know, because it's Friday the thirteenth. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just I I'm so glad that we have a chance to chat about your piece. Um, it's actually the closing number on my new album, which is this one, the second flight. I don't, I don't know if you can see it with it. It's got some glare today. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm excited. I I wanna I wanna hear. It's, it's the closing number, so I guess yeah. I guess that's a, that's an honor. First first and last are always what people remember, right? Where you wanna be. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a great piece, and I think uh, one of the things I like so much about it is that it, it's it's very condensed. Like, it's not a very long piece of music. It's about three. I think I looked at it today. It was about three minutes and fourteen seconds. But in such a short amount of time, it's able to make I think a really attractive and powerful statement. I mean, when I've played it around, um, I guess I've done a number of concerts with it in the South and Midwest and at saxophone festivals and things like this. People really respond to it. And it's ones that people want to know about afterwards, like who's that composer, or where can I get the music, or you know, how, you know, what are these unusual sounds coming out? Like, is that live or is it pre-recorded? I mean, I think it's, I think it's really, really a great piece. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how it is that you came to write this particular piece, and maybe how it became what it is. Well, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad people like it so much, and. And you know, I've noticed that because a lot of people contact me after you you play, they all go like, "Oh, I want to play it too." Because of course, <laughs> you do a such a great job, you know. Oh, um, so um, it's kind of a I, I I don't know exactly how to answer that, but what I can say is this: I've I've always been really interested in in bird sounds you know i i remember many different things about um that that made me think of it one one is this brazilian composer hermeto pascual who does a lot of um a lot of things with people people's speech and also uh, bird sounds and he's uh put music to those over the years right so that was one thing that really kind of uh, had a, a really strong impression on me, uh, you know, growing up in Brazil and listening to that music since I was a kid. Um, and then there was also, um, you know, other things I've, I've always been wanting to do something with that and then later on in my life when I was practicing flute, the, some of the flute repertoire like Varez and things like that. There's a lot of borrowing from the from bird calls and things like that. So I have been inspired to kind of mimic bird calls in some of my orchestral music. If some they're, they're hidden in there, um, and uh, I think the piece, the Sagrada Familia that you you premiered, actually has some bird calls in there. Yeah, tell us about that. In the in the background, you know, as the kind of the the second movement where the lights go in through the 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 windows of the church and and like the sunlight is coming in you can hear like this bird calls in the background too like with the glistening of the light coming in and all that stuff so i mean i've i've, I've always been a very image type of composer you know um I think I think it's it's funny because as you get older, all your interests kind of permeate into into your art, whatever it is. And as a kid, I was really into biology and into birds and and things like that. And and then and then I I got into architecture school. So there's like all those little things that kind of I was really interested in mathematics. So there's a lot of that in my music. So I guess the birds kind of came maybe from that that time and and also 
connected with this idea of, uh, uh, you know, sometimes bringing something that is musical but is not music mm-hmm. per se into into a musical situation where it kind of also forces you to think outside the box, right? Because once you put that in the in 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 the musical setting, um, you're basically obliged to to rethink your entire thing around that. You know, the rhythms are very unique, the melodies are very unique, and basically, to me, was was basically I wanted to create a a sound file from it, or or like a sound design file, and then compose around it. And, and really have that kind of uh, challenge, you know, how do I, and at the same time, it is a challenge and people might think, you know, it's restricting. I find it's liberating because, you know, I'm hearing those melodies and then I'm hearing harmonies and rhythms that go with that, which are basically mine, you know, it's mm-hmm. my background associated with that element that could to some people be restricting but to me is actually just making me think outside the box within my own way of writing music. Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's almost like the bird is the cantus firmus <laughs> and you've kind of yeah, accompanied yeah. It's, it in some it's way. It's basically, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's basically like uh, the bird, you know, I mean, you can, you can associate that kind of stuff with, let's say, Charles Ives music with thought of nature mm-hmm. and people and all kinds of things as being part of the musical spectrum you know right. so the bird is basically the base the bird is basically the melody and i have to put a groove and a rhythm to it you know so is this one bird call or has the bird call been uh how long is the actual well, bird call the bird call repeats itself and it has lots of of different a little variation so what i did is like i picked my favorite elements of it and then i started messing around with it so repeating chopping it up and repeating in different ways sometimes inverting the sound file so it it it, it repeats itself backwards like a like a uh retrograde mm-hmm. so i used a lot of those techniques as i was putting the sound uh, design file first and and also i put that sound design the first thing i did was to try to hear a pulse and then I put the, the, the sound, the file on top of a pulse and I started chopping it up, copying and pasting and inverting and like doing different. Var- so like creating different variations of the original bird call all within that per se pulse. Mm-hmm. So then uh, what happens is it, it kind of some of those variations create more of a groove oriented thing some of them more of a melody oriented thing and then basically then i i sat there and and transcribe all that all the bird things and then based on those melodies and those rhythms i started creating uh the the context you know Mm -hmm. what i heard to enhance that you know so the first thing you did after you did the transcribing and you did the uh, cutting and the pasting and inverting and and playing with the material was it to create the electronics track with the uh, ensemble accompaniment or was it to work with the like did did you did you do the saxophone part next or was it all kind of coming out together? It was all coming out to get well. Basically, first I put the the raw bird track and found a pulse to it then i started chopping and editing right then i created a um a sound design track then i imported that sound design track to oh i see to a notation program and then i started transcribing that as a a bird melody got it as as if the bird was one of the instruments of the ensemble and then i started writing everything below that uh-huh. saxophone and, and electronic accompaniment all at the same time. So would you ever consider doing this piece in a non-electrified way? I thought about it. It would be really hard, but, <laughs> but it would be really fun to do it. Yeah, I thought about it. It could be a chamber piece at, at some point and have it just, um, we could have maybe 
a drummer with a click track, you know, that would be connected to the bird, the bird part, and then everybody else would have to do their parts live, which would be pretty hard. Maybe they can have, <laughs> maybe they can all have the click track at the same time, you yeah. know. But it would be like semi-electronic. The other option would be to do it without the bird at all. Just transcribe everything as it, if they were instruments and let um, and let things be a little bit more loose. Yeah, I think I would be really curious to hear <laughs> to hear that at some point. Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure if we ever do that, it's gonna be with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. So, so you said your image image based com, uh, images really speak to you, and often you compose with images. And I wondered um, clearly the the bird the bird call is so distinct, and and it's po very possible to create an image just from the bird call. But I wondered right. if there's if there's um, do you have an Im image of this bird doing anything? Is it like programmatic in any way, or is it simply the sound? And then you've created the music using the sample, and after that point, it's an exploration of of the call. Well, I think at that point, I I was really focusing on the the phrasing and the rhythm and the angularity of it. You know, um, not so much on the bird per se. You know, mm -hmm. but um, at, at times, you know, depending on what I'm writing, I'm thinking of an entire story or I'm an, an entire, say, image. But in this case, I think it was it was more about the angularity and rhythm of it. You know, that's a very traditional bird everybody knows about in Brazil. You know, as you as you mentioned. Um, you know, Villa Lobos has written. A lot of people have written things um, that were inspired by this bird because it's got a beautiful call, it's got a beautiful name, and it's a very Brazilian bird. You know, and when I started doing this, um, you know, this is this is a long term project. I've only done two pieces, two bird mm -hmm. pieces. The first one for you. And the second one, it hasn't been really, it's been premiered, but it hasn't been recorded yet, is for bass trombone, mm. which is like the complete opposite of a <laughs> bird, right? Yeah. So it, it's a completely different piece. It has a whole other uh, dimension to it, right? But but the idea has always been to create a scenario where the the the, the sound of the bird is incorporated in 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 the chamber structure or electronic chamber structure which is um it also i think it was also related to the fact that i wanted it to be brazilian birds you know mm -hmm. because those are kind of the birds that i i grew up with i grew mm -hmm. up listening to and i think that in a way everything that you do informs your music so i feel like those birds would be closer to me musically oh that's interesting you know then uh so i have a whole collection of recordings of birds huh. you know that are stashed stashed out um away for the future basically who knows when i'm gonna do the next one but they are there you know i can go and listen to it and choose one that i like and and go with it that sounds that sounds awesome <laughs> that whole series does sound super cool yeah so I mean, your your music is you were inspired by a lot of different things. I mean, you've talked about architecture, you've talked about nature, um, and then you're also a composer that I think of who works in multiple genres. You've mentioned Hermeto Pascual, and you've mentioned uh, Villalobos, and you've mentioned Varez, and I'm not sure who else you've mentioned today. But uh, how do you feel that your musical confluences come together? Um, your different inspirations? Are there other folks that you've listened to that you really have been inspired by or people writing even today that are that you find really intriguing? Oh, uh, I, I think there's lots of amazing, you know, past and present composers, you know, and it's like, for example, I, I, uh, I teach a class, a jazz analysis class, and every semester I make my students uh, do research and present on different jazz composers. Mm -hmm. I'm always inspired by that. And I also use another semester of that class where we analyze a lot of 
concepts coming from 20th century music from from Debussy, Ravel and all those. So it's there's I I think of music as being music, you know, and if you want to call it jazz or classical or Brazilian or whatever, you know, of course, th those those are, you know, to a certain extent, real labels. But to a certain extent, you know, the more we progress as a society, the more those are, you know, going to be kind of confluences of, of someone's musical personality, you know. So so the way I feel is I don't want to be, even though I'm, you know, officially a jazz studies professor, I don't want to feel... <laughs> um necessarily constrained by that you know i feel like i can fortunately write whatever i hear you know and sometimes i will i will i'll write for classical musicians and so i will write with with that in mind and sometimes i'll write for jazz musicians and i'll write with that in mind and sometimes i'll write for brazilian musicians and so in other words, nobody's going to be completely comfortable with my music. <laughs> I can attest to this. <laughs> it's always going to be a challenge to someone. Oh, some yeah, point. that double concerto was not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think Arno is still traumatized by that. <laughs> well, he commissioned another piece from you, so it must not have been too bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to say, you know, he must, he must have liked something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that always, um, to me, I mean, I, 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 as a composer and as a player, you know, I recently played, I recently had to do some dual versions on some, some of my large ensemble works, which was really hard to adapt. Mm -hmm. and, and it was pretty uh, interesting to play because I, n none of those pieces I play myself. I'm always conducting. You this know? is from your new immigrant experience yeah. uh, project. The Guggenheim project. So that was really interesting because I love conducting that, but I had never played that. And so playing it, I was a little afraid of playing it myself. But but what I discovered through that process is that I know that music so well, it wasn't hard to play it. Huh. You know, uh -huh. the hardest part was actually the the switch between the different doubles. That's what I was wondering. Doesn't it start on alto flute or something? Yes. Yeah. 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 I was sweating. Nice choice. <laughs> <laughs> I was sweating and saying to myself, "Why did I do this? Yeah. Why you did do this I do this in a different order?" Like, <laughs> I thought it sounded beautiful. I watched oh, that, that concert. You. That was through the the Kennedy Center. Right. Um, yeah, it was. Beautiful. But yeah, but I I think you know I think is always to me, uh, if there's no challenge, you know. Personally, for me, as a player or as a composer, as a as a conductor, or for the people who who are working with me, if there's no challenge, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I write music to be difficult. That's not the point. But I don't want the music to be comfortable at the same time. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? What is it about that edge of discomfort that intrigues you as a composer? I think that I think discomfort is only is not permanent. You know. Mm -hmm is is different so so discomfort you know the discomfort is like part of practicing in a way mm -hmm. not like physical discomfort you know what i'm saying yeah. you don't want to hurt yourself but like this idea that you are not comfortable with a concept or with something and then you have to put that time into it and grow as a musician to feel comfortable with it you know Mm -hmm. Like I have music that I composed 20 years ago, which I sucked at at first, and it was never comfortable. And now they they feel like standards, huh. you know, because I think a lot of the times the, the level of musicianship that has been actually getting better and better with. I mean, look at the saxophone world, man. There's, there's so <laughs> it's incredible, you know, yeah. or the jazz world of any, you know. Why, why does that happen? Because composers are always daring to push the limit a little further, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that makes people push themselves. And then this becomes the new standard and the next one becomes the new standard, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you can contribute to that, and I personally feel like I want to push myself 
as a player to to be a better player in the future if if i can contribute as a composer to that for myself and others then i think it's important because it's 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 the natural evolution of things you know so what are what are some of your kind of near future and maybe slightly further future frontiers when it comes to pushing the envelope either as a performer or as a composer well you know i i uh, i have a, a couple of projects that i'm starting to ruminate mm -hmm. and one has to do with like closing this sort of chapter of of an immigrant experience thing which is started with my first big band record uh, and then evolved into the the Guggenheim one, and so I'm hoping eventually in the future I can finally I can get another grant that will help me finish that uh, that cycle. Which is I, I work a lot in in like trilogy kind of settings, you mm -hmm. know. So there's that. Um, there's a there's a project in mind, but that needs funding. If you're yeah. out there <laughs> wanting to fund a large scale project, let me know. Venmo Felipe <laughs> and, uh, and, and so there's, there's that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's another project that is slowly forming, which is a small group project. And it has to do with some social issues that I want to, uh, you know, that I've been working on educating myself on, and I want to make sure that I can bring that to light, you know? So what is that process like for you uh, to um, work on social issues through your music, through your compositions, through your performance? Where do you feel like the role of of the uh, the composer and the musician is in, in these um, rather large conversations? I mean, you've taken on immigration, which has been, you know, a huge topic for so many years. And of course, has been very strong in the last several years. Um, but I mean, there are so many issues and I, I, I wonder where you feel like, uh, artists can make a difference or contribute or participate. Well, that's a good question because for a long time, I didn't think that I, I had any power to make a difference, you know? Um, but at the end, you know, we are who we are and, and, and I think our music is who we are. To. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, uh, you know, as an immigrant, I had to have a voice in the conversation and it took me a long time to figure out what that voice would be. And I feel like as a composer, I can be a facilitator for people who need to tell their stories, mm -hmm. you know, which is which is kind of a weird thing to say in a way, you know, but I feel like as a composer, it's almost like I I interview people and then I try to tell their story through music. You know, I, I'm very much like I'm I'm very connected with this with the idea of narrative as, as a piece being the form of the piece being in a narrative uh, and images and things like that. Uh, but the other side of it, you know, for example, with the, the New Immigrant um, Experience Project is I, I finally discovered, it's funny to say, I finally discovered after 30 <laughs> years, you know, yeah. that that we have a lot of power in the sense that um, we can talk about issues and address people emotionally before we actually address them intellectually. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? You know, like, for example, somebody who doesn't know anything about immigration and immigration issues might be very um, turned off by a political sociological panel on the issue or something like that. But if they are exposed to uh, an emotional piece that connects them with people directly uh, that might have a whole other um, result mm -hmm. because they're not being asked to be political beings or anything. They are, they're, they're basically being uh, reached out and connected as, as, you know, through their humanity and trying to recognize other people's humanity. 
So in that sense, to me, it's always been kind of like this. Um, when I realized this recently, you know, it, 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 it made sense to me that I can make a difference as an artist, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I've always, you know, I've always thought that art, what makes a difference, what separates art from entertainment is the fact that you have to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. You have to really uh, think about what you're listening to or watching or or seeing, you know, or tasting, whatever it is. But there's there's ideas and there's a discussion and there's a concept behind it. It's not just passive, mm -hmm. you know, passive expectator kind of thing. I think that's a huge difference that's that's the real difference between uh art and entertainment and we are so many times confused with entertainers which we are to a certain level but not mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. you know that's a complicated that's a very complicated to me at least has always been a very difficult uh balance to accept you know yeah uh Especially given the facts of capitalism and, you know, just the way that the market works. And, you know, I mean, uh, um, just uh, I also think about, I guess, some of the large pop acts that have that have right. that have stuck around. You know, I'm thinking about like these biopics that have come out on like Freddie Mercury and the kind of thinking about like artistry meets entertainment in a certain kind of way and how, you know, like, what is that huge level, you know, that kind of like pop superstar level, like who, who are those people and what is the artistry that's, that's there and how do we like, I don't know. It's right. I think about that too. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of artistry there. And I think what, what a lot of the times, what ruins it from the artistic perspective is not the artist itself. It's, mm. is the management around it, you know, yeah. it's the, you know, and, or, or people really not, you know, I've, I've been asked questions such as, why do you write such long tunes? Why don't you, why don't you write something a little more popular? You know, yeah. Yeah. that's, that's not, you know, that's not the question, right? you know, right. uh, I don't know. To me, I write what I feel is right. You know, if one day is popular or not popular, you know, if it's popular, I'll be happy. I'll make some money out of it. You know, if it's not popular, it's okay because that's what that's what felt right. You know, right, and right, right, right. and that's more important to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in academia. You know, be... <laughs> right right now, I would be at home doing nothing because there's a pandemic. But you know. I would be touring with some pop act or something that, but that's, that's not how I wanted to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I think a lot about this because this is what this album is kind of getting at. Um, the whole album is pieces that are sort of located in the cracks, either between genres or between, you know, in your case, sure, genre, but also there's kind of a natural world, artificial world connection there, or, you know, same with electronics, or there's, they're all kind of like, just in between things. And I, I've been really interested in, in digging in these kinds of cracks, because I think there is so much beautiful music that's to be had there, so many beautiful experiences, so many beautiful human experiences, and each of the pieces on the album, you know, has required a vastly different set of collaborators and collaborations you know there's some pieces that are um, this one was me and you and the electronics and then there was another one you know with uh, with uh, another saxophone player and there's another one with a pianist and it you know so many different permutations um sitting alongside so many different genres and i i just i i really resonate with that kind of idea of boundaries and in-betweens and and porous boundaries and the possibility for um, connections that are maybe unexpected and I've, I've been listening to a lot of albums lately and I think this you know I think this has been going on obviously for a long time there's you know the idea of a crossover album has always been there but what that word has meant has changed a lot over time and um, a lot I've noticed a bunch of recent albums 
that are also dealing with boundaries and borders. Just this week, I listened to an album by Edward Goodman uh, called Liminal, which is also dealing with that idea of liminality of that kind of space. And another album by Jamie Rose Guarine called Transparent Boundaries, which is about uh, also these kinds of things. And so I'm thinking about like your work on New Immigrant Experience and um, this uh, festival, this uh, um, what would you call it? A workshop I participated in, a fellowship I participated in that was um, targeting on the idea of trespass, because I think this idea of boundaries has really come up, especially in the last four or five years around these kinds of issues. And I feel like so many artists are turning to those spaces and trying to dig and trying to understand why things are the way they are and trying to understand what do they have to be this way and what can we do about, you know, making these boundaries like in some ways more porous and in some ways more significant. I feel like there's also so much depth to something like jazz or there's so much depth to something like classical music and and so much depth to Brazilian music, which you which you also touched on. And so that there's these kinds of like lineages and then there's the kind of future vision of maybe the possibility of mixing. Um, but I think there's like a little bit of a tension there, you know, to be like, we're only going to be in the cracks and there's going to be no more genre. You know, people want to cancel Beethoven and people want to cancel all this stuff. And I think, OK, you know, maybe maybe that's OK. Like, I think, you know, 50 percent of the concert series is Beethoven. We're really not doing ourselves any any services in terms of like making this music alive and meaningful today. And yet that kind of like idea of almost heritage or lineage in combination with these boundaries, I think is so fertile. I, yeah, I, th I think I think we need both, you know, I think you need, I think in order to, I mean, I live in the cracks, you know, but let's be honest, to live in the cracks, the right way requires a lot of work, you know, yeah. a lot of work you need to be proficient in many different languages to be able to find the language in between them, you know, mm -hmm. or otherwise it becomes a gimmick, mm -hmm. you know. And I think one of the things that you were talking about earlier is this idea that, that the crossover is changing the, the idea, because I think a lot of the times, and it's been uh happening in classical music for many many years a little bit as a gimmick mm -hmm. you know as a way to bring in the audience or whatever but but when when you find the people who actually understands both languages both genres then you can actually really have a deep conversation about what it is to ride in the crossover between them you know and i think that's what that's what's really important, you know, is to bring bring those two um, traditions respectfully together mm -hmm. in the conversation, you know, and then sometimes start new traditions, you know, or other things like that. But I think it's always important to, you know, it's like people, you know, if somebody, if I, if I, you know, if if I'm here living in the US and I've, I've know this culture and I speak this language and I've been here for longer than I've been in Brazil, that, that doesn't take away the fact that I'm Brazilian, you know, by mm -hmm. birth and raised there. So, so those two identities are never going to be separated yet. They can't, they are two completely different traditions and they actually are separated but they are together at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think it's, I think the depth of the conversation is what's changing, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, I think it has to do with the times. And I think it also has to do with not everybody's like this, but I think there's, there's a whole, whole new generation of performers like yourself who are genuinely curious, you know, and and I think that's what makes the difference, you know, because if people are not curious, they don't want to learn about other things. They don't they're not interested that then this conversation never happens for real. You know, mm -hmm. it becomes just a gimmick, you know, oh, that's that's cute. I'll just I'll just put a little bit of that on my on my repertoire, you know, 
you know so it becomes kind of like this you know you have to have a piazzolla piece because it looks good to have like a latin american you know i mean i love piazzolla believe me i i love him to death he's one of my favorite composers but what i'm saying is that there's a lot of this kind of conversation kind of like let's take a little bit of that just to look good and it's not like the people are not really interested in the the tango tradition mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying because mm -hmm. you know i've i've heard a lot of people play piazzolla and it sucks because they don't understand what it's coming from mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they never even listen to piazzolla play mm -hmm. they just play what's in the page mm -hmm. and that's not the conversation you know, you want to play Piazzolla, you should listen to Piazzolla. You should understand what Piazzolla is about. Hopefully mm -hmm. even have some, some you know, um, Argentinian barbecue in Buenos Aires. <laughs> that helps. Believe me, I've been there. Yeah, I hung out with, sure the, does help. with with tango musicians a lot. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a way of life. I mean, even Piazzolla said that. Mm -hmm. Not saying you have to move to to Buenos Aires, but you have to be interested. You have to be curious, and you have to try to get deeper into what that means. Yeah. You know, in terms of uh, conversation. Anyhow, and and it's difficult because it takes a lot of curiosity, a lot of time, a lot of dedication, right? A lot of other mm -hmm. things. You know, this and is definitely definitely one of the hardest projects I've ever had to do because each of them there's I, th I think like eight or nine different pieces and they're all so different and to try to get to any level of depth was really daunting um, and you and I have collaborated a lot over the years and your music always challenges me I'm always studying to try to figure out like how do I improvise in this weird meter over these unusual chords and I don't know how to do this with string chord that like <laughs> there's, always, <laughs> there's always a challenge <laughs> right yeah. But but at the same time, what is what is really cool about the project is that you're collaborating with living composers, right? right. So your chance to learn from that from that situation and really have that conversation directly with the source, mm -hmm. you know, that's invaluable. No, there's nothing like there's nothing you know? really like that process of of actual intimate collaboration that right you know, to like grow as a as a musician, I think. You can't do that with Beethoven. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Most I people mean, cannot. There are probably a few. <laughs> but you I mean the best you could do like with Chopin is like bring a bottle of champagne to uh to uh Paris and go visit his you know his tomb there and and just hang out with him and have a conversation while you get drunk, but he's not gonna answer, you know. So possibly not. So, so yeah, so I think that's, that's the, that's the cool thing about it, you know, to be able to learn from the source in a, in a, and really make this dialogue really deep, you know, and I, I think the source also learned from you, you know, and I think that's, you know, in, in, in my case, I know you for a long time. So obviously I'm writing with you in mind. Right. 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 So there's, there's that too and sometimes i might say you know i i know i know that jonathan does this really well so i'm gonna write here without worries but sometimes i might go i want to i want to get jonathan to do something different you know i want to get jonathan to growl on a saxophone <laughs> or something like this you know yeah, yeah. So I mean, all of this is is really beautiful and and intriguing, and I feel like this conversation is is so rich and represents a lot of what's um, a lot of the ideas and perspectives that are that are that are being thrown around in the music world right now, and also in society in general. And you know, I just want to highlight the importance of of that and the kind of relevance of of new music as part of that conversation. Um, and I think it's really wonderful the ways in which you're directly engaging with uh, political issues, uh, even if this exact piece isn't, you know, there's a way right. in which you just simply being who you are with the identities that you embody, uh, listening to the kinds of things that you're interested in is going to produce relevant music, you know, and it's relevant to so many of the different discussions um, 
And so I'm wondering, you know, as you think out beyond this pandemic and you think into the next next few years and the next even 10 years, you know, what do you imagine as kind of the future? Like if you could have a crystal ball and stare into it and, and tell us about the music business in, in five, 10 years, what, what do you what do you see? Well, I mean, I hope we'll we'll get done with this pandemic and i know it's gonna take a while for people to feel comfortable again to go to concerts and things like that but i do i do believe that there's a couple of things that this pandemic has showed us and one is how much we need art and live music and and live art and i think that when there will be a time when people feel comfortable, I think that that is going to be a a boom in in uh, in in opportunities for artists. I hope you know. At the same time, I think that there's um, there's a huge impact on you know people are are, are being forced to use technology and learn from it, which which can be good. You know, and I feel like there's also going to be this feeling in the background where, you know, if this happened once, it could happen again. Mm. So people, people are not going to take their planning for granted. They're not going to take their uh, technological skills and, and whatever uh, things they're doing for granted, because I think that, you know, it's, Nobody ever thought something like that would happen. It was always like a sci-fi movie mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, scenario, but but now it's here, you know, and and it and it's trying to teach us something. And I think what it's trying to teach us is that um, we really we really value the human contact that we lost and and the, the arts that we lost, and so. Um, as much as people can adapt to the circumstances, I don't think that they will adapt to, to a world without those things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, we value things when they're taken away from us. And I guess, uh, that's a lesson we are going to learn. Yeah. And also, you know, uh, live, live music making and live teaching is a must, mm -hmm. you know? And people have learned that. They try to do the best they can with the technology, but it's not the same thing. It's never gonna be. And I think I think that's a lesson that we're learning, you know. Yeah. Let's you know, let's hope that that um the opportunities financially are gonna be as as solid as the appetite that I think people are gonna have for yeah, it. I hope so. So. But I also, I also, you know, if there's one more more thing I can say is I feel like as much as this sucks, the kind of struggle that we go to, it's it's it reverts itself into wisdom and and the, and artistic uh, and, and and basically it all comes back as part of your your artistic expression. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, art, art doesn't come from comfortable, you know, swimming pools in Beverly Hills, you know, they come from the struggle, you know, you could, you could look at the history of the world and the history of uh, artists and, and it's always been a struggle. It's always been a struggle to, in many different directions, you know, financially and, and psychologically and you know, all kinds of issues, you know, and, and those artists had to go through. And I think that that's what made their art so powerful. So now we're all in this struggle together, you know, so <laughs> yeah. it's going to affect all of us, the value that we give and what we give, I think. Well, Felipe, thank you so much for taking the time and for sure. sharing your wisdom and experience. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm wise. <laughs> I don't know if I'm wise, but I talk a lot. <laughs> no, I think you know. I I really believe that that we all have wisdom in in different ways, and it's really beautiful to share that. And I'm really appreciative. 
and um, really appreciative of the piece as well. It's a wonderful piece. And Thank you. if there are any saxophone players watching it, I hope you uh, get it and play the crap out of it and uh, play it better than me. So <laughs> keep it going. <laughs> it's a and, great piece. And send me a recording. I always love to hear people play in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.